Hi. Today, we're going to finish talking about accommodating student variability. So we've already talked about the different types of disabilities identified by IDEA, and we've talked about gifted learners. So now we're going to put it all together and really talk about accommodating these learners in the classroom. So the first thing we're going to talk about is ability grouping, and this is where I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit here and talk about what the research really says as opposed to what the textbook presented. So I'd like you to kind of ignore what the textbook says um, when you read this section and really focus on my lecture here. So ability grouping. Um, when we talk about ability grouping, we can talk about between class groupings, um, which really um, and that would be grouping kids in different classes based upon their levels of ability. And we do have actually quite a bit of research support for this, um, especially with um, higher ability learners. So we know that things like acceleration, AP, IB, and honors courses do increase achievement um, for the learners who are in the classroom. And those are typically by ability. And we also know that it doesn't necessarily give a benefit for students who um, who can't um, who don't have the capability to do well. And then when we allow learners to learn at their accelerated pace, that they do better perform better, um, both socially and academically. Um, another way that we can think about between class ability grouping is what we call um, cluster grouping. And this is where rather than having an entire class of advanced learners and then another class of special education learners and another class of um, you know, English language learners, and when we have cluster grouping, that's where we put um, eight to 10 kids um, in one classroom. So let's say that we could put gifted, we could put like two gifted kids or four gifted kids in every single of the five sections of class, or we could cluster group them and put eight to 10 kids in a couple of classes. And this has an advantage of still um, not having an entirely segregated class, but also allowing the teacher to better differentiate when you have a critical mass of kids, when you have that cluster group, then you can make those accommodations in your class for that entire group at once, rather than only just for a few kids where they tend to get lost in the shuffle. So what we know is that differentiation is really difficult. It's, a, it's an advanced skill for a teacher and one that I hope you're developing that probably won't be fully developed when you first go in the classroom. And if we can um, lower the range of abilities within the classroom so that we can, give, we can give a teacher a more limited range, then those teachers are better able to accommodate the specific needs in their classroom. So cluster grouping is another option. And we also, we also do sheltered language instruction. So we put um, a group of English language learners together in a classroom where we can provide that sheltered support um, rather than just putting one or two in a classroom together, similar to cluster grouping. So we really actually do have support for between class grouping and that's different than tracking. So tracking is when you identify kids early on and you put them in a specific track, like you have one group of kids that's in a college track and they're getting advanced classes and you have another group of kids that's in a vocational track and they're getting lower classes and there's really no ability to move between those tracks. And that's not what we're talking about here at all. Um, in this ability grouping, there would be the ability for a student to move between tracks depending on how their achievement might change over time. Um, and it also allows teachers to, to teach kids um, in different capabilities and in different areas. So we wouldn't necessarily expect that a kid would be an accelerated or an advanced class in every single subject area all the time, that that would allow students to move in between or even from year to year. So you might need to be an advanced biology class, but chemistry you might not want to be or might not have, um, might not be your area of strength. So we could switch in between. So again, um, I disagree with the book on ability class grouping, um, ability grouping, uh, particularly when it comes to advanced learners, because there is a lot of support for that. Um, and we also know another argument against ability grouping is that having the advanced kids in a class um, somehow brings up the rest of the class. And what we find is that's not really true, that, um, that the rest of the class doesn't necessarily get a benefit from being with the most advanced learners. Um, in fact, um, when we remove those advanced learners from a class, then it allows other kids to shine. It allows um, other kids to rise to the top and be the leaders in their classroom. So um, there's just really not a lot of support to say that we shouldn't have honors classes or advanced classes. Um, so your textbook's not always correct. Um, we also have within ability, within class ability grouping, and that's the type of grouping you might do within your class. 
this idea that you might group kids together um, by ability at different times. Um, things like flexible grouping or regrouping, this idea that um, you wouldn't always, you wouldn't identify a kid, kids in groups and keep them in that group the entire year, but that you would be continually assessing and redoing those groups as kids' achievement levels change depending on the unit and depending on their rates of growth. Um, the Joplin plan is um, kind of a mix between the within class and between class groupings where you have multiple grade levels within a classroom. This allows our advanced workers to work at above grade levels, which is amazing. It also allows some of our um, some of our students who need more support to work at some grade levels below and still be a part of their same groups. Um, we also have differentiation, which you would do within a class. And again, you can only, only do differentiation well if you're doing some ability grouping, you're doing some learning prep so that the kids are together um, at their level of performance for that particular activity. And then we also have um, response to intervention or multi-tiered systems of support, which are within schools um, ways to provide support for our at-risk or, or students who need some more support in a particular area. And that, those programs rely upon continuous assessment of students so that you're constantly adapting your instruction to their needs. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about homogeneous versus heterogeneous grouping. So homogeneous grouping means that you're putting kids of like ability together. And heterogeneous grouping means that you're putting kids of different abilities together in a group. You might be grouping by interest or by, um, or you might be purposely putting mixed abilities together with a high student with a low student. And really, when you're grouping kids together, you always want to have a purpose for that grouping. You want to think about why am I grouping? And there's reasons why you would want to do either one. The book is very against homogeneous grouping, um, but I disagree with that. I think that homogeneous grouping is the most effective way, and the research supports is the most effective way when you're delivering instruction. And all of our research on differentiation would also support this. If I need to have kids group to read together, I need to put the kids who are all reading at the same level in the same group so they can read the same book. It doesn't make sense to put kids of different reading levels in an in the same group, um, unless, of course, I want to do some sort of peer or support. And I'm going to make a note about peer tutoring here, is that sometimes our gifted kids are often asked to do peer tutoring or to help their fellow students learn something. And what I want to say is that we have our really advanced students, they're not necessarily the best peer tutors. Um, think about it. If I learned how to add like three years ago, and I'm being asked to teach someone else how to add, A, Teaching them how to add isn't going to strengthen my understanding of addition because I've already learned it and mastered that, mastered that concept a long time ago. On the other hand, if it's someone who just learned that concept, they're going to be, um, by teaching someone else, that's going to reinforce and strengthen their learning. So it's much more effective for both learners to have someone closer to that learning um, teach it. Also, if I just, if I learned something a long time ago, it's now automatic for me and I'm not necessarily going to be able to teach it well because it's already become something I'm used to. Plus, um, we're not paying those kids to be teachers. You're the teacher in the classroom and those, the gifted kids also deserve to be taught and to learn something new every day. They don't need to be the teacher. So it's really an equity thing as well. That being said, sometimes putting um, mixed ability groups together could be important um, if you're exploring a concept, if you um, want to have some diversity in your groups. Um, it's great for um, your short activities, the types of activities where you're just introducing a concept to, to students. Um, but if you're doing a more uh, um, evaluative type project, or if you're doing something where you're really going to be teaching at a specific level, you want to think about homogeneous grouping for instruction. You want to think about what's right and fair to students. Um, when you have mixed ability groupings, all the times the burden goes to the higher ability student um, to carry the weight of the group. So where it might look like that helps the lower achieving student um, have higher achievement, are they really learning from that experience or are they just relying on the higher ability student to do the work? And that wouldn't be right. I'm really thinking about that equity issue. So again, um, there are times and places for heterogeneous grouping, but in, for the most part in your class, you are probably going to be relying on home, flexible homogeneous grouping. That means that you're constantly assessing and putting kids in groups. 
If you want to use homogeneous, heterogeneous grouping in your classroom, you might think about rather than pairing the very highest with the very lowest, pairing your highest student with a middle student and then pairing your lowest student with another middle student so that we're not doing the high with the low, but you're doing high with middle and low with middle. And then it kind of works out a little bit better as far as um, creating that diversity of groups and still balancing those instructional needs. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about IDEA and IEPs and what the Department of Education and their rules are. So IDEA stands for the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act. Um, it calls for free and appropriate education um, for all students, um, relying upon a pre-placement evaluation. So we have to evaluate students before they qualify. It should be in the student's native language. Um, it should have a valid test using multiple measures and a multidisciplinary team. When we talk about valid tests, we want to make sure that if we're measuring for intelligence, and let's say that we want to check for that, then we want to make sure that other disabilities aren't getting in the way. So if I have a student with, them with dyslexia and I give them a written test, then that test isn't going to measure their intelligence, right? It's just going to measure their disability. So we want to make sure that the tests are really valid and that native language that could also include sign language um, or for our deaf or hard of hearing students. Um, and then that leads us to an IEP, which is an individual education plan. So we have an IEP for every student who falls or qualifies for IDEA. And we're all of those levels of disability, all those disabilities I outlined in a previous lecture, those are all correspond with the areas for IDEA. So an IEP should have the current levels of the student, what they are currently capable of doing, along with measurable goals for the future with a timeline on when we're going to assess those goals. Um, along with any supports or accommodations that will be made for instruction. So these accommodations are going to focus on the types of things that you would do as a teacher or in a classroom to support your student. So that might mean um, both modifying the instruction, so we might be teaching at a different grade level or um, different content standards that align to our um, the standards that we have um, based upon the state standards like the um, Common Core or the Florida State Standards. Um, and we also might have accommodations for things like assessment, so things like um, extended time, um, a quiet testing environment, um, those types of accommodations that are larger print for a student who might be visually impaired. Those are the types of accommodations we might have on an IEP for a student um, for assessments. And a key part of this is to remember that if we want to have an accommodation for a student that is written for the FSA, so the state accountability testing, and it has to be part of a student's IEP or 504 plan. Let's talk about the next. Oh, and it also calls for the least restrictive environment. And least restrictive environment means that we want to include students in the um, in the typical education as much as possible while still giving them the education that they need. So let's talk a little bit more about that least restrictive environment or the inclusion model as it's commonly called. So the inclusion model uh, means that special education students really do benefit both um, by being a part of the regular classroom, both socially and academically. And we want to try to accommodate that or put them in that regular classroom environment for as much of the day as possible, the least restrictive environment. Prior to the passage of IDEA, it was really common for a student, no matter what their disability, so even if they just had dyslexia or a mild impairment, to be placed in a special education classroom full time um, without appropriate education being given and not part of the regular curriculum. So what we're trying to do now is push those kids into a regular classroom as much as possible, with the, but the key piece of this is with the proper support. So we also know that um, a disproportionate number of students of color are identified for special education students. So by separating um, a special education students from the typical students, this could be an issue with um, segregation. If we think back to Brown versus Board of the Education, Board of Education, we know that separate and but equal is not um, appropriate. So as um, considering the disproportionate number of students of color who are identified for special education, it's really important that we're including them in the typical classroom environment as much as possible. Um, but we want to think about, are there times in which full inclusion um, doesn't provide the best academic or social benefits for students with exceptionalities? Um, and certainly, we this is not eliminated. Um, self-contained classrooms or special schools for students with disabilities. So um, there are times in which 
the level of instruction that a student needs in order to gain um, academic to make academic growth cannot be met in a school classroom. So, for example, if I have a student who is working on really life skills um, versus um, academic goals, um, then the typical classroom environment um, full time would not be the right placement for them because they need to be working on other types of skills. Um, like using the toilet and um, tying their shoes and those types of activities that wouldn't be taught in a classroom. Um, at the other time, they should be allowed and there should be accommodations made for them to be part of the typical classroom for part of the day. So maybe that student can join the rest of the class for PE or for art or for music um, or during lunch in the cafeteria. There are times in which the student should be included um, in the typical classroom environment for as much of the day as possible. So let's talk a little bit about 504 plans, um, and that's another legislative rule that applies support for students. Let's talk about that. So a sec 504 applies to Section 504 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. Um, it was also part of the ADA Amendments Act in 2008, and it really focuses on accessibility, applying to all federally funded programs. So all federally funded programs must um, be accessible to all to all people, regardless of their disability, um, that may impact their life purposes, and um, and government agencies um, or federally funded programs must make accommodations within their facilities in order that everyone can have access to them. So this is really important. Um, that we as schools are thinking about who has access to our curriculum and to our instruction and are there students who may not fall under um, IDEA but still have problems with access. So let's look a little bit at the differences between a 504 and an IEP. And, and this is a question that I get a lot and even as a parent um, I was really confused about the difference between the two. So the first thing to know is that an IEP um, goes back to the Department of Education where a 504 goes back to the Office of Civil Rights. So it's kind of controlled by two different governmental agencies. Um, to, excuse me, to qualify for an IEP, you have to have a specific disability that falls under those categories that I mentioned um, in a previous lecture. And it has to impact educational performance. So in order to have an IEP, I really have to demonstrate that it had adverse effect um, on my academics. Um, versus a 504, I just have to show that I have a disability that impacts my life, a major life function. I don't have to show that it impacts me educationally necessary, necessarily. And that's something that um, a lot of school districts um, don't um, always follow. So it's important that you as a parent and you as a teacher can really advocate for your students and know that um, you can qualify for a 504 plan even if there isn't an educational um, impact yet. The school still has to make accommodations. For example, and this is a really easy one I like to think of, if, um, if I um, have a leg amputation, let's say, um, I might qualify for a 504. I can still be doing fabulously in all of my AP classes, my honors classes. I can be a straight A student, have no problems, but the school still has to write a ramp for me, right? They, I don't have to demonstrate that not having a ramp is going to affect my education. I just have to show, look, I need to be able to access this education, right? Um, in an IEP, um, specialized education services are also included. So if I needed a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, a behavior modification therapy, those types of things would be um, covered in an IEP, um, getting, going to a resource room, having an aide or a paraprofessional. That's generally covered in IEP versus a 504 is really about accommodating um, and making um, things accessible for students. So things like longer testing time, if that's going to allow me to access um, and show my and participate in the education more fully, then that would fall under a 504 as well. It does not have to be an IEP. Um, another important difference is that an IEP um, is only applies to the public school system. So it only applies um, through 12th grade. It starts at age three and goes through 12th grade. Um, versus a 504 plan um, would apply for your whole life. Um, so for example, if I have a senior in high school and they only have an IEP, but they're planning on going to college, I'm gonna wanna set up a 504 plan as well because that 504 plan will follow them to college. The IEP will not. Um, Again, um, and that 504 plan applies to every 
other workplaces um, and universities, whereas the IEP doesn't. So it's just really important to think about um, having both or which one is more appropriate for a student. And again, many students only have a 504 plan and not an IEP, um, and you're still legally obligated to fulfill the requirements of that 504 plan. Um, this can include, um, it can include um, testing accommodations, it can include um, things like preferential seating, repeating instructions and clarifying instructions for a student. Um, and it can also include um, things like um, the use of assistive devices and um, making sure that the, the classroom and the school um, is accommodating for any physical limitations of a student. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about the technology for exceptional learners and the types of things that you as a teacher um, might use to support learners. So the first thing I want to talk about that's really cool is called Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. And UDL is um, a way in which a teacher could organize and set up um, his or her classroom so that everything is already accessible for the multitude of needs and um, exceptionalities that might that might could possibly one day be in a classroom. The idea is that you have multiple means of accessing the material and multiple means of expressing that learning where ideally you're not having to make a lot of modifications or changes to your assignments for students, but you're allowing everyone to access it at their level um, and with their various modes. So um, one of the things I've tried really hard to do in this class is, um, is, is embrace some UDL principles. So you can see, for example, all of my lectures have closed captioning. That way students who um, could be deaf or hard of hearing can still access the things that I'm saying through the lectures. I've also made my um, PowerPoints available both through PDF and through PowerPoint so that students who may have visual disabilities may be able to um, enlarge the text to, to read those materials as well. Um, so we want to assume in UDL the differences are the norm, that we're not going to assume that typical and the average student or that, that there is such a thing even as average um, or that we're going to assume that that the norm for a classroom would be that I would have students with exceptionalities and that I should make that a part of my everyday life. So some things that you could do in your classroom um, for UDL, um, we could be thinking about things like making your PDFs um, accessible using closed captioning devices, um, thinking about the layout of your classroom, would it be accessible for a student in a wheelchair? Um, do you have multiple ways to sit in your classroom? Do you have, um, do, you, do you take breaks like you would need to do for a student with ADHD? Just thinking about a lot of the accommodations we make for students with disabilities would really be accommodations that lots of students could benefit from. Another example would be um, giving an open-ended project. So if I give an open-ended project, that allows um, a range of answers, and students are going to answer that at the level that they're at. So if I say, well, I want you to make an application of this concept, we could do that at a really basic level or at a really deep level, and that would allow everyone to participate in the learning, um, even if they're doing it at different levels. Okay, so another, another type of technology um, for students with hearing impairments. Um, we have things like closed captioning for students who can't hear. So we typically think of that as things like on television or on videos, making sure that's available. And if we think about having closed captioning, not just for our students who are hard of hearing, but it would benefit lots of students. Um, students with dyslexia would be able to read the words and associate them, right? Um, and learning to read. Um, it can also help, I mean, I usually watch TV with closed captioning on because it helps me understand the words. So closed captioning is an example. Um, for students with, um, with hearing impairments, we might also have um, CART or other transcription services available where you have someone come into your class and, and really do a live typing of the things that you're saying in class. Um, we also have audio amplification devices. So typically that's some sort of microphone that you might wear around your neck as a teacher that would, um, that would capture your voice and then transmit it directly to the student. Do some sort of listening aid. 
um, and these are great. And um, when you have this in class, um, one thing you sometimes have to remember is that if you're going to do some sort of discussion, that the student might not have access to the microphone. So you as a teacher might need to repeat what the other students say so that the, that student has access, or you might need to pass the microphone around so that everyone can speak into it. Um, one funny story about this is um, when I was in graduate school, I had a student, um, there's a student in one of my classes who, who had one of these devices and so my professor was wearing the microphone and we took a break in class and um, the professor went to use the restroom and she forgot to take the microphone off. So pro tip, um, if you're gonna be doing personal business, you probably wanna take the microphone off so the student doesn't have to hear every, uh, all of that as well, right? Yeah. Oops. Um, and then there's also personal devices. So um, things like hearing aids and cochlear implants um, are another assistive device that a student may have um, in order to assist their hearing. And I know there's lots of controversy within the deaf community about cochlear implants. Um, and really the important thing is that we have access to language at an early age. So, um, and that is often done through sign language. So I'm not gonna get into the whole debate here about the differences between the two. Just know that you as a teacher might experience both. So of course we also have sign language interpreters, which isn't necessarily a, a technology per se, um, but another way in which we're getting access for our hearing impaired students. Um, so we have visually impaired students. Um, so we have um, synthesized speech. So this is um, a way in which, you know, in computer programs, they can read aloud the text that's um, on the screen to a student. Um, so some things you can do if you're creating a website or you're creating pages that students might be reading is that if you have an image that you're adding captions to it. So this is something that I've really tried to make a habit in this class. And um, if you notice, if you kind of hover over any of the images in the course, you'll see a caption to it. That's so that students who are visually impaired um, can read what the image says and looks like. Um, we can also do something to shorten long hyperlinks rather than leaving the whole long hyperlink out because you can imagine if that's being read aloud, it would be really annoying. So if you can hide the hyperlinks into a click here or into the name of the web page, that's a better for students who have visual impairments and who might be using this type of assisted technology. There's also technology that will magnify text. Um, it can be as simple as a magnifying glass, right? But also um, on the computer screens. Um, so the problem with that is that some software that we might be using for students is not compatible with that magnifying of text. And so it doesn't do it very well. And it's hard and difficult for students to navigate the websites or the types of technology. So you want to be careful when adopting new technology for your classroom that it would be um, compliant in this way. <laughs> Um, and the last thing you can do is um, when you're giving presentations or you're um, talking to your classes is making sure that you have um, these things available for your students ahead of time electronically. Um, and that provides benefits for all students, right? As you can notice in my class, I do this, right? And I'll, I put them in both PDF and PowerPoint formats um, because depending on the students and the types of computers and software that they have, either one of those might be better for them to access. Um, and also for all of you, right? Some of you may or may not have PowerPoint installed on your computers, but you can still access the PDFs or vice versa, right? Um, a warning about PDFs is that um, if you're just converting like a Word document to PDF, then most um, of those synthesized readers can still read the PDF. But if it's an image, rather like a scan, rather than a text, a lot of times the software may not be able to pick up that text and read it to the visually impaired person. So it's important that you're really thinking about when you have an, a text that's true text and not just an image of text, um, because they won't have access to that through their computer software if, it's, if that's the case. Okay, so let's talk about orthopedic impairments. And I put a picture of Speechless up here um, as a popular cultural reference to the types of orthopedic impairments that might impact and might need assistive technology. So if you haven't seen this TV show, it's worth a couple of episodes at least to get a feeling for what this might be like. Um, so we can have technology that can assist with communications. There might be um, ways in which a student with um, orthopedic impairments might be able to point to pictures that can convert it to speech or have someone else convert it for them so they can under so that they can um, talk even if they don't have the physical control of their vocal cords. It can also assist with um, physical skills so having an electronic wheelchair um, that they can control with their head or their mouth. 
um, or to also manipulate objects. Um, so my mom um, was a middle school art teacher for many years, and she on more than one occasion had quadriplegic students in her classroom who were able to access the art curriculum by using um, paint brushes and materials in their mouths to paint. So um, there's a wide variety of assistive technology in this case to help students access the types of classroom activities that they might want to pursue. And then finally, um, students with learning disabilities, um, there's quite a bit of software available to help students. Um, there's lots of writing software that can not only help students with students and word generation, but also with the organization and integration of ideas. Um, and then things like individualized computer software. Um, the school district, um, Duval County Schools, is using um, iReady and Achieve 3000. And this can be a benefit for students who, are, who might be performing at a lower grade level to access that material. And it can provide individualized instruction on specific skills that the teachers can push out to students. Um, so that can be a benefit. Um, and we also have assistive technology for gifted learners. Um, so ways, some software we can use. Again, um, things like iReady and Achieve 3000 can be beneficial for gifted learners because it can allow them to move through the curriculum at their own pace and give them advanced material within the classroom. However, since these materials aren't designed specifically for gifted learners, um, sometimes the materials can still be too repetitive or too remedial for, for gifted learners. There's also software, something similar to um, a program called Renzuli Learning um, or Khan Academy and Crash Course that provide instruction for students um, that they could access ahead of where they are to pursue topics of individual interest. Um, there's also accelerated programs. So programs that would allow students to, um, to access and learn material um, above their grade level. So let's say that I was um, in sixth grade and I really was ready for some geometry instruction. I could um, use Florida Virtual School, even within my own school and school's resources, to take a geometry class above my grade level. So in that way, Florida Virtual School um, is, can, could be a real benefit to our public school system to allow kids to move more quickly through the curriculum um, at their own pace. There's also programs, um, the Center for Talent Development and the Center for Talented Youth um, at Northwestern and Johns Hopkins, which um, provide um, online instruction for gifted learners in advanced pace, so in a wide variety of topics. So that's another resource for gifted learners that might want to move more quickly. And then there's also enrichment programs online for students. Um, a big um, a big player in that field is um, the Duke Talent Identification Program, and they do um, enrichment online programs. My son participated last year and he um, was part of a group and there was um, an outbreak of a disease and they had to kind of calculate the data and manipulate it and try to solve the mystery as a team uh, all online and it was really a fabulous experience. So um, and what I loved about it is it allowed him to connect with kids all over the country and with an educator right from our home. So I didn't have even if I um, was in a rural location where I didn't have access to other types of support for my gifted learner, and um, we could do this online, which is pretty darn amazing if you ask me. So again, if you have more questions about the types of assistive technology available for gifted learners or for anybody, and more questions about 504 plans or IEPs, um, please feel free to reach out to me. It's been a pleasure, and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Bye.